Well, good evening, everyone. I'm bringing you this message tonight from my quarantine location, which is my bedroom. You can see pictures of my kiddos right over my shoulder here. Glad to have them join me tonight. And uh, for those who haven't heard, I tested positive for COVID this week. I'm, I'm really doing pretty well. Symptoms seem to be mild, uh, just some tiredness and achiness at times. I can't taste and smell, which is frustrating. Um, but I want to say thank you for all the prayers. I really believe that prayer makes a difference, and uh, thank you for praying for me. This has been a, a, a very eventful week for all of us. We experienced a derecho storm, which I had never heard of before, but uh, I would definitely say that we will never forget that moving forward. Several still don't have power. Places like Marshalltown and Cedar Rapids were devastated. Pray for those in our uh, in those communities and several around our area that still don't have power, and and pray for the farmers who've had to um, endure a lot and lost a lot of their crops, been damaged. Um, but I want to just uh, say this uh, and ask you this question. Do you pay attention to signs when you see them? And I'm sure you're saying that 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 depends. Um, it's easy to ignore signs, especially when those signs have been there for a while. So I go back to this week earlier uh, when... Um, uh, I first realized that I didn't have taste. Uh, that was a sign, and a sign that I wasn't uh, wasn't thrilled about at all. Actually, something I was very disappointed when it happened, and I tested it to see and made sure that it was the case, and immediately went into isolation and quarantining. Uh, also, uh, another sign this week uh, on Monday when the storm was coming in, uh, I could see in the horizon that there was dark clouds and I heard sirens going, but I didn't quite understand because I hadn't seen any tornado warnings on my phone. And uh, But there were definitely signs uh, around with the uh, sirens going off. And so um, what do we do when we hear those signs? Like I said, it's easy to ignore them sometimes, especially when we get used to them or we, uh, we've we seen them for quite a while. This... Uh, has happened repeatedly with uh, trucks who travel down Harrison Street or Brady Street in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, there are uh, videos and there's actually a Facebook page for these truck eating bridges. And um, I want to show you a clip here in just a moment, about a minute long clip of this bridge in Davenport, Iowa. So far, the bridge has won every one of these encounters. Watch this video. Isn't that just an amazing video? I could sit and watch that for minutes, and I have done so on multiple occasions. But one article that I found about this bridge says that scenes of stunned drivers staring at crushed hulks of their trailers, their cargo littering the roadway, were common over the years until the Iowa Department of Transportation installed a height detection system with electric warning signs on Harrison Street in 2001. Even with all the new signs and warning systems, crashes continue to happen. He said, I counted three sets of flashing yellow lights and lots of signs on Harrison Street, but the bridge still gets hit. Why is that? Because signs are often disregarded. Signs alone don't help if you don't pay attention to them. In the passage of scripture that we're looking at this evening, Mark chapter 8, we're going to see that the enemies of Jesus wanted some additional signs, but Jesus knew that wasn't the answer that they needed. The disciples of Jesus want to believe but often ignore the signs as well. In our passage this evening, we see two groups of people. We see the phony Pharisees who are unsettled 
who are settled in their unbelief and the forgetful followers who are unsettled in their belief. So I want to look uh, first at those who are settled in their unbelief. Uh, see the context of this as we go back to Mark chapter 8, verse 10. And uh, at, in, in verse 10, Jesus has just fed the 4,000. He's ending a six to eight months journey where he's taken the good news to the unreached Gentiles. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. And as he arrives back on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, we read in verse 11 that the Pharisees came and started to argue with him and testing him. They demanded that he show them a sign from heaven to prove his authority. Jesus has already given these religious leaders many signs, but they haven't paid attention. All they wanted to do was argue with him and find a way to trap him. There were plenty of signs for the Pharisees to see, but they had ignored all of them. Jesus had healed their diseases, cast out their demons, healed the deaf, and raised the dead. What other signs did they need? In response to the demands of the phony Pharisees who were settled in their unbelief, Jesus does two things. First, he denounces them. Their attitude affects Jesus emotionally in verse 12, where it says, uh, when he heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit. He sighed deeply because of the hardness of these Pharisees' hearts. Jesus then asked them a probing question. Why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? In other passages, Jesus describes this generation as evil and adulterous, a faithless generation. He tells the Pharisees, I tell you the truth, I will not give this generation any such sign. And so not only does he denounce them, he departs from them. In verse 13, it says that he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Just like immediately, abruptly, he departs because Jesus knows that these men have become settled in their unbelief. They want to fight. They don't want to grow in faith. They want to argue, not accept what's true. Jesus no doubt knew, as, as uh, the scriptures say, Proverbs 23, 9, do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. And Proverbs 18, 2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. And that were these, these Pharisees that he was dealing with. Because these men were so hardened against the Lord, Jesus denounces them and then departs from them. Phony Pharisees can become hardened, but so can forgetful followers. The disciples who were close to Jesus had a hard time believing in him, even when the signs were very clear. So we see the, the settled unbelief of the phony Pharisees. And here we um, have the unsettled belief of the forgetful followers of Jesus. His closest followers were forgetful and unsettled in their belief. We look at verse 14. Now they had, uh, they, they had forgotten to bring bread. And when they had only one loaf with them in the boat, it's it's easy to forget things. I understand many of us are forgetful. We forget things all the time. But having said that, I wonder how they could have forgotten bread when there were seven large baskets of leftovers available from the feeding of the 4,000 that happened just a few verses ago. They look around the boat and they see just one loaf of bread. You can sense a little bit of frustration in Jesus. He's trying to, he's trying to take them deep, and they're all wrapped up in uh, not having lunch. In verse 16, it says they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. I think they were pointing fingers at each other, uh, basically blaming each other, saying, it's your fault. In verse 17, Jesus sets them up for eight rapid-fire questions as a way to help them and to help us become more settled in our belief in him as the true bread of life. This is a teachable moment as Jesus uses the loaf of bread as a visual aid. And as we look at these questions, we see that Jesus is appealing to their heads, to their hearts, and to their hands. And this is a good process for us to go through as well when we find our own faith faltering. The first thing is that we need to remember God's power. The first two questions found in verse 17 are designed to stir up their memories. Jesus asked these questions, Why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Jesus wants them to think more deeply about the bread than they have been because they totally misunderstood the message. Haven't you put this together yet, he said. Are your hearts too hard to take this in? And then he gives them two more questions that sounds like a parent to a child. And he says this to them. You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? And he follows up by saying, don't you remember anything at all? 
The best place to start when you're having difficulty is to focus on the facts. Bring to mind those things that you know to be true about God. That's why it's imperative to read the Bible every day. It helps us to remember his words and to reflect on his work in our lives. Let me give you an example from Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19 to 24. Jeremiah is lamenting how difficult things have been as he reflects on the destruction of Jerusalem. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words, he says. When our minds are set on suffering and pain, we end up in a really bad place. It's important that we remember God's power. This is what Jeremiah does in verse 20 as he remembers the facts about God and who he is. He says, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over this time. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. See, he finds his hope returning, but not until he disciplines himself to remember what is true. When he does that, listen to how he explodes in exultation in verses 22 to 24. He says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercy never ceases. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin fresh every morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. When your faith is faltering, do you remind yourself to focus on what is true? In those times, we need to remember God's power. And the second thing we need to do is to reflect on God's purposes. One of these eight questions is directed to our hearts. It's found in the last part of verse 17, where Jesus says, are your hearts too hardened to take it in? While those are, uh, who are settled in their unbelief have hardened hearts, it's possible for followers of Jesus to have hearts that have become hardened as well. I'm sure they didn't like hearing this question. Do you ever hear yourself saying something like this? I used to feel like Jesus was near, but I don't feel that way anymore. When we use words like this, we know we're living by feelings, not by faith. Listen, our faith is built on fact, not on feelings. Feelings by their very nature will fluctuate. Feelings are important, but they should never drive our faith. Jeremiah 29, 11 speaks to our purposes where God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Romans 8, 28, Paul says, we know that in all things, God works uh, together for the good of those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. So in order to grow in your faith, you need to start by remembering God's power. Uh, in our head, we need to remember God's power. And then reflect on his purposes in our hearts so that we don't let our hearts become hardened. And finally, we need to replay the provision that God has put in our hands. Knowing that our thoughts and our feelings can be scattered and untrustworthy, Jesus draws his disciples to replay how he has provided for them in the past. And he asks two more questions in verse 19 and 20. He says this, When I broke the loaves and fish for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said 12. And for the 4,000, how many baskets of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. Jesus had them think back, which wasn't all that long before, and replay how God had provided for them in the past. And we have to do the same thing. When we remember his faithfulness in the past, we'll realize that he can do the same in our present. That's why Psalm 103 verse 2 says, forget not all his benefits. All of these are not questions designed to shame or to blame, but rather to teach, train, and equip. That's what Jesus does. So let's remember God's power in our heads. Let's reflect on his purposes in our hearts. And let's replay the provision that God has placed in our hands in the past. And when we do, we're going to grow in our faith as well. And we'll believe that what he did before, he can do again. Because God is who he said he is. He can do what he said he'll do. And he uh, is going to fulfill all of his promises that are found in Scripture uh, to his people. We need to see the signs. Jesus has given us plenty of signs. We just need to follow them. So what about you? Don't ignore the signs any longer, because if you do, you're heading for a crash. We need to all submit and surrender to Jesus Christ, to his authority, to his plan, to his purpose today. And when we do so, we cross over from death to life. So tonight, if you've never invited Jesus into your life, I invite you and encourage you to do that. It's simple. It's just a matter of saying, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I am wrong. And I want you to forgive me and save me. Give me new life through what you've done on the cross for me. 
I accept this new life and salvation through Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Tonight, if you uh, are struggling and it's hard for you to remember, uh, maybe there's signs all around and it's just easy to get your, uh, your eyes and your heart and your mind on the pain and the problems, I encourage you to look to Jesus. He has been so faithful in the past. He'll continue to be faithful in the future. He's got so much in store for you. Let's not forget the bread that he uh, multiplied just a few verses ago when we get in the boat and realize we only have one loaf of bread. What are we going to do? Let's let that challenge us and speak to us in our lives as we pursue Jesus with all of our hearts. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us tonight.